Hello, I will be discussing about constructivism. Particularly, I will focus on Jerome's, uh, Jerome Bruner's constructivism theory, Wolfheimer's just theory, and David Osubel's subsumption theory. So let's discuss first Jerome Bruner's constructivism theory. By definition, constructivism presets that learners derive meaning and form concepts out of their own experiences. Meaning, learners are not just passive in such a way that the teacher will not give them the definition or the thing that they should learn, but they should define it or construct it based on their experiences and by, real, uh, by the realization using their prior knowledge and combining it with the present learning. Also, in the process, the learning reflects the, on the experiences and then creates new understanding and new knowledge from a new experience. So, as what I have said, how do you define meaning in constructivism? By experience. So, there is an experience, then you get to eventually come up with new learning or new knowledge. So, constructivism, learners get to experience for them to learn something. Not the teacher immediately giving them something, but the learners get to experience it. Eventually, then, they will construct it with their own understanding or using their own understanding. And it is said that if the experience is related to the previous one or basically your prior knowledge, the leader revises the knowledge and that understanding and disregards whatever information is deemed irrelevant. So there is already a deeper understanding. Because for example, you have learned in the past that 1 plus 1 equals 1. But then again, you also learn in the present that there is another way of solving that. And if ever there is a misconception or wrong understanding that you have experienced in the past, because you get to learn new things in the present, you get to forget what you have uh, learned which is wrong in the past. Like for example, if you generalize in the past that all males are cheaters just because in your first experience, your boyfriend cheated on you or your girlfriend cheated on you, but then again, in your next relationship, you get to experience uh, comfort, there is already a, a good experience, basically, then you get to change your perception that males or other partners are cheaters. So Brunner's constructivism theory, again, it was proposed by Jerome Brunner, and he believes that learning is an active process where learners can create new ideas and concepts using their current and past knowledge about things, events, and situation. So again, there is a utilization of the prior knowledge and your present knowledge. So we have here uh, what is emphasized by Jerome Bruner here is the concept of active learning. So this is active learning. What does it mean? Students don't just sit down, but they learn because they try to manipulate things. They are hands-on. Moving on, we have here, he also uh, defined constructivism by stating that learners can select information and transform them into new ones or add up to them to make decisions or create a new set of understanding. Either you get to improve your knowledge in the past or you get to change your knowledge in the past. So that's the concept of constructivism. And of course, when properly guided and motivated, they can go beyond information given to them. So if you will guide them, particularly as future teachers, and motivate them, they will just go beyond more than what you expect them to get or to create. One of the prominent concepts used by Jerome Bruner is categorization. It means classification. It means grouping. And what does it entail? It involves perception, the way you see things, the way you feel it, so uh, the understanding of using our senses. 
conceptualization. How do we get to see it? How do we get to understand it? Okay? Decision making and even making our inferences, our judgments, our uh, connecting, uh, predicting what will happen. And Brunner encourages teachers to allow students to discover concepts by themselves. Through how, how do or how will our students discover concepts on their own? By providing learning opportunities and activities that would really guarantee that they will explore and experiment. So we go away with pen and paper just by giving them quizzes, okay, quizzes that are objective. But we assure that students get to really explore by uh, exp experimenting. Learning by doing is also related to this one. The learner should also never fear committing mistakes. This is the very important one concept also. The trial and error. That it's okay to try and then commit mistakes. And of course, you need to assure that you learn from your mistakes. Just like in life, right? When you encounter some difficulty, you need to guarantee yourselves, guarantee to yourselves that you will stand up and then learn from that experience. Never stay in the low status of life. What does it mean? If people would try to eventually bring you down or you are in the lowest position, do not just settle for that. Move on. Strive harder. Okay? Don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to commit errors. Because how would you know that you cannot do it if you haven't even tried it? So that's the concept of categorization also. Learners must feel that it is okay to commit mistake. And of course, by that mistake, the next time around, they learn from it already. Brunner also emphasized four major aspects. What are these? First one, the predisposition towards, or towards learning. Second, how a body of knowledge can be structured so that it can be most readily grasped by learner. Third one, the most effective sequences in is which to present in which to present the material. And the fourth one, the nature or pacing of rewards and punishment. So what does it mean? First one, pre predisposition of learning. The child's readiness to learn is an important aspect to consider in learning concepts and skills. Predisposition means their attitude, their stand towards learning. If our students are not ready to learn, of course, even if you are the most uh, effective teacher, you're the most uh, awarded teacher, and you are the top notcher of the class, however, your students are not ready to learn it, it will still be useless. Just like, for example, that's why if you happen to observe in 4A's lesson planning, before we begin our lesson, there is always an activity. An activity which is connected or which will connect the prior knowledge of our students to the present knowledge. Why? Because it will allow them to prepare for the learning or the lesson that you are about to teach them. So, always consider whether your students are ready, okay? It is said also that love of learning should be emphasized at an early stage. They say you should teach the students not what to learn, but how to learn. Because it's, uh, it's more important. I'd like to believe that's correct also. Because if you will just give them information, there is a high tendency that they forgot, uh, forget about it. But if they will teach them, if you will teach them rather the skill, even if you are not around, but you have imparted on them the concept of or the, the importance of learning and how to learn it, they will figure it out on their own, even without your guidance. Okay, and one of the most factors to encourage the love of learning is from the parents and teacher. Parents should be positive about the learning of our students. Teachers should also support the learning of our students. That's why do not immediately 
or do not be too particular whether they have the correct answer or wrong ones. Encourage them first that it's okay to commit mistakes. Next one, how a body knowledge can be structured so that it can be most readily grasped by the learners. Topics and concepts are effectively learned when details are, are arranged and ordered in a context of the learner. Which means that always relate it to something that will inspire the students or something which the student students are interested of. Like for example, if you were teaching a Filipino students, do not just use apples, apples, grapes, grapes, especially those who are in the far flung areas, but use examples that are relatable to them. So instead of using grapes, apples, why not why not use guava? Why not use uh, mangoes? Okay, as examples, right? So that's what we mean by structured by which the learners can really understand because it is within their context. It is something that they can rela uh, relate to. The most effective, the third one, is about the sequence. Uh, this comes, uh, this will talk about sequencing. Whether from easy to difficult and so on. Sequencing of presentation is part of the teacher's innovation of teaching. The teacher considers which the learners need most. That's why, right? Uh, in creating a, a syllabus, we don't just teach a subject or a topic just because we like it. But it goes through some process. Like for example, before the SEM will start or before the school year will start, teachers will gather and create syllabus or lesson plans or even the books created. It's not, the, the topics are not arranged just because the author liked it that way. But there is the reason why, mathemat why in mathematics, addition comes first before subtraction, before multiplication, and before division. So there is a reason of the order of things. So that's the number three concept is all about what is all about. It means that they should have a prerequisite knowledge for them to master the present one. So before they will move on to subtraction, teach them first how to count numbers, how to add numbers. Because how can they subtract or how can they add? If they don't even know what is one, how to count one, what is the concept of one, right? So that's number three. Number one, of course, we have here the nature and pacing of rewards and punishment. Who doesn't like rewards, right? We do like rewards. One way or another, it motivates us. Rewards and punishment should be properly selected and that whenever they are given to learners, they should know and understand why they are rewarded and punished. Let your students understand why they are receiving rewards. Let them know what did they do wrong or what they did as wrong for them to be punished. Just because you feel to punish your students, it doesn't mean it's okay. So there must be a reason, and that reason must be clear to your students. Am I clear? Okay. Jerome Bruner's Constructivism Theory. Now let's move on to Gestalt Psychology, or this Gestalt Theory by Weltheimer. Gestalt came from the German term, which means pattern or form. It means that you learn, you categorize based on seeing the bigger picture rather than on the individual parts. Just thought psychology was introduced by, who, was, who introduced this one? Max Wertheimer. He was a German psychologist who believed that the whole, this is the major concept, Maxwell Timer, and the whole is more than just the totality of its part. So, the bigger picture is more important compared to the summing up of its, and the man, uh, mm, the of its part, okay? So, 
the whole is more than the part, uh, the sum of its parts. And then the focus is about grouping. So how do you group this? We have your either from similarity, proximity, another one is continuity, and the other one is closure. Sana all my closure. First one, similarity. How do you group from the way that's have similar? Elements, you group them if elements have the same or nearly the same features. Like for example, in a class, how do you group your students if it is the concept of similarity? So all oh, all students who likes math who like math oh you should be grouped together because you have similar likes. Okay, all female students must be grouped together because you're all female. So what is common? It should be the basis for the grouping. Proximity from the word itself proxim. Mithi. It means distance. Elements that are near to each other are grouped together. So you group them because they are near with each other. Like for example, you group students from who are sitting with each other or beside each other rather than those who are in row 1 should be grouped to those who are in row 4. Malayo sila. So, sino ang igugrupo mo or prepare mo? So, those who are in row 1 should be in one group. Not with 1 from row 1 to a row 4. But it must be kung ano or kung sino ang mas malapit sa kanila. Continuity. Elements that define smooth lines or even curves, uh, curves are grouped together. So, if there is a pattern, you group them if it will continue the pattern. Example, you have observed that the pattern in a certain group is male, fe female, male. So in the next group, you should also group it. Male, female, male. Male, female, male. So it will continue the pattern because there is a smooth line. And we have your closure. Okay? The way you group them is something that will fill the missing part or complete the entity. Example, have you tried doing the Rubik's Cube? Were you able to finish it? That could be an example of the closure. The way you group those cubes, the colors of the cubes, it's because, okay, and what, what's your main, main goal here? To, what? Close the gap. So, dapat matigil ang pattern. There must be an end to ang pattern. To the pattern. If in continuity you wanted to continue the pattern, in closure you wanted to put an end on it. Sana all my closure. Hindi yung continuity. Niloko ka na nga sa continuity, pinatuloy mo pa. So, it must be closure. If niloko ka nung isa, i-close mo na. So just how theory looks into individuals' way of problem solving, our way of solving patterns, solving problem. And it is said that a person can solve a problem if he has a good understanding of the overall or general structure. How do we get to understand things? If we see the bigger picture, diba? Not na lang. Oh, here, this is similarity. You group them, they are grouped. It's because they are, this one in this row, they are all without shade. And then the other one with shade. And then another one with shade. Okay. And we have your continuity. They are grouped because 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. So what will be the grouping here? Another one here. So that is continue the pattern. So closure, you group them together to end. There is no other entry point but an ending point and proximity they are grouped together be because they are closer with each other and they are grouped together it's because they are closer compared to those in this group so that's the so. moving on we have here to sum it up just so theory looks into how people organize their learning by looking at their experiences both inside and outside the classroom. And when the instruction given are related to their experiences, learning effectively takes place. Keyword, connect what is learned inside the classroom to the experience of the students.
And here are the major principles of just cell theory. The learner should be encouraged to discover the underlying nature of a topic or a problem. Give them something, an idea rather, on what is the topic is all about. Gaps. Incongruities, disturbances are an essential stimulus for learning. What does it mean? There must be some, something that will motivate the students to think. Instruction should be based upon the laws of organization, continuity, proximity, and closure. And that is just how theory. Now let's move on to the subsumption theory by David Asuba. I guess what I've said, it was developed by David Osubel, and it emphasizes that how individual learns large amount of meaningful material from both verbal and textual presentation in a school setting. The combination basically involves what they know and what is the given example. So, concept and examples or pictures. It states that the use of advanced organizers is a useful way of learning. So, the students must see things. Like for example, fishbone, Venn diagram, uh, what else? Uh, the organizational chart, the KWL. It is or those are essential elements for students to learn better. And when we talk about subsumption, it means to put in, uh, to put or include something within something larger or more comprehensive. Give them the bigger picture. Show them the bigger picture so that they will understand it. Okay? An individual's cognitive structure consists of all his learning experiences that make up his knowledge, facts, concepts, and other The four learning processes of subsumption. Derivation from concept to specific. Correlative, it's the concept of assimilation. Pinalali mo yung nalaman mo. Superordinate, it is from specific to general. Examples before concept. Combinatorial, it's combining what you learned even if they are different concepts to better understand these concepts. And there are basically types of advanced organizers, expository, narrative, schematic, and graphic organizers. If it is expository, it describes the new content, it elaborates, it uh, gives you information, so it, it exposes. Narrative, if it gives an information in such a way that it tells a story. Skimming. What's the difference between skimming and scanning? Just remember, if it is skimming, double M, main idea. If it is scanning, what's the double here? The double letter, N, noting details, okay? Graphic organizers, these are visual set up for the outline of the information. Example, fish diagram, Venn, uh, fish bone rather, Venn diagram, tables, and then the likes. So these are the basic advanced organizers.